Hey, hi guys, and welcome to my microbiology video. And in this video, I'll be discussing some recent emerging diseases. So the learning objectives are to understand what an emerging or re-emerging disease is, to give examples of some of the current emerging diseases, to understand the factors that contribute to emerging or re-emerging vaccine preventable diseases. So these are ones that have been previously eliminated, but may have the potential to come back. To know how emerging diseases are detected and how risk assessments can be carried to prevent the emergence of disease. And to understand the relevance of controlling zoonotic reservoirs and their role in spreading diseases. As well as relevance of infection control practices. So let's just have a look at a definition. Okay, so an emerging disease as classified by the World Health Organization is a disease which has appeared in the population for the first time or that may have existed previously but is rapidly increasing in incidence or geographic range. Okay, so this is basically mean that this is a scenario where you have a potential pathogen in an area, which if it is transmitted into a human host by accidental transmission, zoonotic transmission, vector-borne, or whatever the case may be, it will have the potential to cause an outbreak, so a widespread devastating disease. As, as we know from re recently, the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, which, is, which I'll discuss in a future video. So an emerging disease is one which just recently happens as the first outbreak of it, and a re-emerging disease is when it has appeared again, as again, this is what's happened with Ebola over several years. So we're just going to discuss a list of emerging diseases. So the National Institute of, Al of Allergy and Infectious Disease, NIAID, categorizes pathogens based on their priority. So this is like a series of ranking systems. So we've got category A, category B, and category C. Now, all the information I'm going to be discussing in these next few slides are found on this website, which I have linked here. So if the information I've said is not clear enough, again, yeah, just go to their website and they'll tell you everything you need to know. Okay, so the, the topmost category is category A, and this will these diseases require you to wear proper protective measures, so like the hazmat suit we see in the bottom right. So these pose the highest risk to national security and public health because they can easily be disseminated or transmitted, so they can spread rapidly, result in high mortality and have the potential for major public health impact, so they can kill people basically, may cause public panic and social disruption. So again, if you've seen like films about zombie apocalypses or whatever, like as soon as that starts, people will start flooding, escaping, mass evacuations, God knows. So it can cause a mass social upset and disease. And they require special action for public health preparedness. So they require strict preventative measures and strict procedures in order to prevent the outbreak or the dissemination of the disease. So a few examples of these is Bacillus anthracis, so the bacteria which causes anthrax, Clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism, Senior pestis, which causes plague, which we had the biggest outbreak like during the Black Death period back then, and also the viral hemorrhagic fever. So this is Ebola, dengue, and Marburg. Then we've got category B. So these are moderately easy to disseminate, moderate morbidity and, mort and low mortality. So there is quite a high rate of them, but they're not anywhere near as fatal. So these still require specific enhancements for diagnostic capacity and enhanced disease surveillance. They still require some form of surveillance. So these pathogens can include Clostridium perfringens, the bacterium for typhus fever, any sort of Salmonella, Hepatitis A, Toxoplasma gondii, which is a parasite, Microsporidia, and the West Nile virus. Okay, then we've got category C. So these contain pathogens that could be biologically engineered for mass dissemination in the future because of their availability, the ease of production and dissemination, so you can genetically modify them so they're able to transmit easier, or can have genetically modified pathogenesis or virulence, so more potent toxins, faster reproductive times, etc. And the potential for higher morbidity, mortality rates, and major health impacts. So again, as I said, if you improve their virulence, then you can use them as biological warfare, which is which is in the case of like anthrax, for example, which is why anthrax is also category A, because it is such a deadly bacterium. So a few examples of these is 
is t is mycobacterium tuberculosis. So you may think, oh gosh, TB, that is, shouldn't that be a serious infection? Well, yes and no, because as of now, we do, we do have cases where TB is treated and preventable, but it is starting to progress into like MDR TB, which is multiple drug resistant TB, and XDR TB, so extensively drug resistant TB. But these can still be further modified, so at the moment they can. It is moderately easy to transmit, but if under the situation where it could become transmitted a lot easier, we will have a severe outbreak, and especially with the resistance of TB, it would cause some serious damage. Influenza is another example because the virus transmits so easily, but it doesn't pose that much great risk like normally. It can, has the potential to cause mass disease. As the case, for example, swine flu and Spanish flu, which have caused th thousands and thousands of deaths worldwide. Prions, again, are another example. They're small proteins which can cause disease, but they're latent, so we, we still don't quite fully understand the mechanisms of some of the pathogenesis of prions. Then they've got other diseases such as severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome virus and yellow fever. So we're just going to start talking about the factors contributing to the emergence and re-emergence of infectious diseases. So one of the main factors that can affect is ecological changes. So this is for example, it's like economic development and land use. So as a population can spread and build up and take up more land, they'll be exposed to different environments where certain bacteria could have been living by themselves. And all of a sudden, if you introduce like mankind to it, those bacteria could then get involved within humans and thus could start a disease. Agriculture, so for example deforestation, again land grabbing, so as you advance outwards you'd be interrupting the environment, thus bacteria, viruses or whatever can somehow make their way into the human host. And again climate change, so for example as the temperatures of the plant is warming up, this, the spread of mosquitoes in Africa for example is slowly starting to spread out, so eventually if the global temperatures keep rising, you could have malaria spreading not only in Africa, but it could start reaching like southern Europe or western southern America. Human demographics and behaviour. This is not just like environmental changes, this is the actual behaviour of people themselves. So population movements, so again, as as I said, like if you're slowly expanding your, your land grabbing, if you move from one place to another, that could aid the transmission of diseases. So although malaria is situated in Africa, if you travel from Africa, say back to the UK, and you were bit by the Anopheles mosquito and carry the malarial parasite, yes, although you're not in Africa, you are still a carrier now for that malarial parasite, which if for some reason could then get retransmitted, it can then cause another outbreak. Overcrowding, for example, if people are in close proximity to each other, and say, for example, some coughs, it will literally start passing on to people closer. And also being in close contact means there'll be more physical contact, so those diseases which are spread by physical contact, such as Ebola, will cause mass outbreak of disease. And again, beliefs, this is another thing which happens in Ebola, which I'm not going to discuss now because it's a major part of my next video. So some more factors. So technological advancements. So development of vaccines and treatment options. So as we can develop more and more vaccines, we can prevent more and more outbreaks. So this is such as the case of like smallpox, which we have which we have previously eliminated. Microbial adaptation and mutation. So this can include like antigenic drift and antibiotic resistance. So the influenza virus has all sorts of different variations, such as the H and the N antigens, depending on the strain. And as you know, probably throughout the year, the strains of flu can change. This is because it has this such great ability of antigenic drift. So it's constantly mutating and adapting to always overcome the host immune system. And again, antibiotic resistance for bacteria that are now able to be resistant to our conventional antibiotics. We need to keep developing new antibiotics in order to combat these antibiotic resistant pathogens. Breakdown in public health measures. So Restrictions in sanitation, funding, and proper practical procedures can also promote the outbreak of a disease. So some diseases can re-emerge despite being dormant or have been completely removed from existence. 
So these are diseases which have, have had vaccines developed, such as the eradication of smallpox in 1980. However, some vaccine preventable diseases can re-emerge. So for example, measles, mumps and pertussis. Although we have got the vaccines for these, there is still the potential for these again to have antigenic change. So the, so the vaccine will no longer be applicable to that strain. Some of the other factors that can affect re-emergence is the vaccine itself. So again, if the vaccine does not contain a high enough quality of antigen or attenuated pathogen, then it's not going to benefit the host from the vaccine. It's literally just going to be injecting something pointless into them, so they're not going to benefit from it. Financial restriction to vaccinate a whole population. So it is expensive to, to have a vaccination program for a whole population which is why most organisations and governments will only vaccinate those who are at most risk to stop the spread. So rather than inoculating the whole or vaccinating the whole population, they'll do those within the proximity of the outbreak to prevent any further dissemination. And the pathogens can escape from vaccine-induced immunity. So again, as I said, this is where the pathogen can mutate. So therefore that vaccine will no longer be applicable to them. So now we're going to talk about the detection of emerging diseases. So we can use two different ways. We've got horizon scanning and surveillance. So horizon scanning is a detection of incidences or unusual events that pose a potential threat to health. So this, for instance, is if you've got the one-off case. So for example, over in America, we've had cases of people catching bubonic plague. So this is something we thought disappeared with the ancients. But no, there are still cases of bubonic plague going around. So, And then keeping monitoring of these, right, informal and formal, so informal meaning people themselves report it and formal being like doctors and organizations reporting it to professionals then the surveillance is like for example the who disease outbreak news so large health organizations which are constantly monitoring all of the outbreaks or incidences worldwide and they also are responsible for monitoring areas of potential risk so for example in zoonotic potential so how can animal reservoirs can affect the a potential outbreak of a disease. So these organizations must always be performing risk assessments, okay? So they must be analyzing the probability of infection. So how likely a disease is for to cause an infectious threat. The impact on human health, so how high of morbidity and mortality rates this disease the potential disease could cause. And also in terms of context, so how it can affect the public and what funding would be available for that disease if there was an outbreak and how serious it could be and also how the government themselves and the politics involved will help or influence how we can respond to the outbreak so some of the most common causes of outbreaks is by zoonotic emerging diseases so these are diseases which are transmitted by animals to humans this could be vector-borne so like by insects such as mosquitoes ticks or it can just be by contamination or accidental involvement. So the example I'm going to talk about here is something called Toxocara. So this is a parasitic worm, which usually has a life cycle of like rabbits, dogs, and puppies. And then you've got humans are, who are the accidental host. So let's just follow the life cycle. So imagine here we've got a puppy who is infected with Toxocara. And upon defecation, they will pass, the eggs will be passed through the feces. And in the external environment, the eggs will mature and will embryonate. So imagine you've got these eggs just laying about in the soil or on mud. You could have another animal, such as another dog, another puppy, will consume or soil or in feces which is contaminated with this, and that egg will then somehow make its way into their digestive tract. In here, it will mature into adult toxicara worms, and again, will then continue to lay eggs and the cycle will repeat over and over again. But again, this is the usual process within animals, but sometimes it can make its way into humans. So this could be by like toddlers, for example, playing in soil, eating soil, putting their hands in their mouth, touching animals and putting their hands in their mouth. They're, that way the eggs will make their way into, the, into their bodies and thus they can get infected with Toxicara. But the good news is this is a completely preventable disease. It's not something that can currently cause a massive outbreak, but it's something that we can use as an infection control sample. So ways that we can control this is by cleaning the animal living area. So making sure that where the animals have defecated, 
you bleach it, clean it, make sure no remnants of fecal matter remains. I'm also teaching kids to not play in areas where animals defecate, so making sure your child knows this is an area where animals have pooped, don't let them play there or stick their hands in their mouth if they've been touching anything around there. And on the situations where you have been handling animals, wash your hands with soap and warm water after handling pets. So also making sure you get underneath the nails where eggs will often embed themselves and will, again eventually will find their way into you. And again, not only teaching yourself the importance of washing hands, but also your, the children and then passing on this information throughout. And then also routinely deworming your pets to make sure that they are also worm free so they cannot go on contaminating around themselves. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the test yourself section. So here I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And I'm not going to tell you how many marks are worth. I'm not going to tell you the marking for it. I'm going to let you decide how much that can be worth. So the first question is define emerging disease. Does discuss the NIAID categorization of emerging pathogens and give some examples of pathogens within each category. What preventative measures can be put into place to prevent an outbreak caused by zoonotic transmission? Again, this is, this is my video on microbiology and emerging diseases. And in my next of my series of emerging diseases, I'm going to talk about the recent outbreaks of Ebola and the mechanisms behind that and how that became an emerging disease. So thank you for watching, guys. Just make sure you hit me a thumbs up if you did enjoy the video and if this helps you in any shape or way or form. And also, if you've got any questions, just let me know down in the comment sections below and I'll reply as soon as I can. And also, if you've got any questions which you want fellow viewers to answer so you can say stuff like a case study question or just a general question feel free to do that it will really help you so again thanks for watching peace out guys and girls